And on that positive note, we have uh, Apostle, Evangelist, Pastor, Prophet, uh, Man of God, Man of Power for that. No, I'm teasing. It's because I've got a microphone. I'm being naughty now. Mark started kind of a series which, which grew and grew. And you'll notice I jumped up last week and I said, don't try and all cram it into the last three minutes. I really resonate with this word, and I think it's where we're at in our spirit. And uh, thank you, Mark. Take it away. Bless you. Can you guys hear me? Good thing I didn't raise my voice there. Huh? It could have been quite loud. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. It's quite a privilege and an honor again to be here. I always take this very seriously because the reality is that majority of believers that are hungry for the truth are the ones who wake up in the morning and come to church. Isn't that right? Are you hungry for the truth? I've never seen people more sad about a compliment in their whole lives. <laughs> I'm complimenting you. you. You are willing to get up this morning and be here, and I'm commending you. Well done for doing that. Amen? Amen. There's another thing that before I get started this morning, I'd like to just do. You know, I travel quite a bit. Many of you don't know me um, from that perspective necessarily, but I've traveled for many years into different churches, different places, and I've, speaking in, I've spoken in different arenas, even at the Mighty Men's Conference in Mossel Bay, I've spoken in different arenas. It's not like um, I'm unfamiliar with the way that things work in churches, there are many different formats, different styles, different things, different ways in which pastors run their churches, etc. But, you know, one of the most important things is that it's very rare to find people who are fully sold out and committed to the advancement, the equipping, and the deploying of the people who are in their church. It's one of the rarest things that you can find because people are dealing with their own insecurities and so those things can get in the way. But when you find people who are willing to sacrifice in their lives in order to see people that God has entrusted them with go further, then, then they want them to go further than even than they've ever gone. Then you have a treasure. And if I can ask... Steve and Janet, if you can just stand up. I'd like to honor the pastor of this house. Please, if you guys can stand up for me. Yeah, both of you. I mentioned both of you. Because you guys, you've got to realize that these two people have sacrificed on a daily basis for this community. And I've watched them for the last couple of years that I've been here, I think it's five or six years that I've been here, I've been watching them, and I'm telling you now, there's not a single decision that they make that they don't make, considering every single one of you and how it will impact you. And I think we can give them a hand. Let's stand and give them a hand. Thank you so much, Steve and Janet, for being who God has called you to be. You are a great blessing to this house. And I think we'd all agree, right? They are a fundamental blessing to this house. And it, it really is something very close to my heart because I'm telling you, it's very rare to see people with such treasure in their hearts make those sacrifices. So we really need to do a good job of honoring those people who are making those sacrifices. The Bible is very clear about those being in the kingdom of God who are the greatest are the ones who serve the most. The kingdom of God is not about you strutting your stuff and making yourself look all big. It's about serving. It's about laying down your life, fathers. It's not about you, because the day you got born again, you were okay. How many of you believe you got saved and that's it? You're saved. So you don't believe you're just saved? No, because when you get saved, what happens? You come into something new. Isn't that right? So you don't just stand at the cross and keep looking at the cross and say, I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm a sinner saved by grace. That's not what you do. Why? Because Jesus is calling us to come 
in to him. Not just stand in front of him and just admit where we're at, but to actually come into him and live the life that he has modeled for us, the very life that he's empowered us to live by entering into him and following him. That's powerful, guys. That means that you stopped being a sinner saved by grace the day you got saved, and you're a saint and a son and a daughter of the living God, an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven, a representative of your father on the earth. We have this glorious royal family that we are part of, every single one of us kings and queens in the kingdom of which he is king over all. This is our glorious inheritance if we choose to keep it. Amen? The Bible says, endure to the end and you will receive the crown of life. That means no quitting in the kingdom. Never give up, never surrender. Am I right? That's right. That's, that's the way that we win. That's why praise and worship is so powerful. Because what are you doing when you praise and worship? Your, declara your, your declaration is the very thing that is your confession, is the very thing that you're coming in agreement with. It's not just a couple of nice songs so we can have some emotional, you know, feel-good feelings. No, no, this is us declaring our Father, who He is, what He's done, acknowledging that which He's done and that which He's put in us. So it's important. Amen? So how many of you enjoyed um, Kingdom Family 1 last week? All right, okay. We've got at least five fans. It's awesome. Um, not that it matters. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He's uh, my biggest fan, and I'm really only preaching for him, to be honest. <laughs> so praise the Lord. I wanted to just recap a little bit on last week for those of you who maybe weren't here. And um, just to remind you that I was talking about the fact that Family is the blueprint and the model for kingdom. Family is the blueprint and the model for kingdom. In the sense that God was originally a family within himself, right? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they are there. They're a community, right? And they blueprinted this thing where they created man in their image and likeness, and man then was to have family, and family was supposed to extend throughout the whole world. And once that family had gone throughout the whole earth and filled it and subdued it, then basically God's plan would have been achieved. That which he had purposed in his heart to set in motion from the beginning. His plan is still the same. He hasn't changed his plan. He's just changed the way in which it's done. Because now we've got to take people that are part of existing families of the flesh and bring them into a spiritual family and equip them on how to walk in this new spiritual reality of who they are in Christ. Does that sum it up okay for everybody? All right. So we then spoke about some things about family that are important. And we spoke about authority and leadership. You know, what is God's divine structure? What is the blueprint for family according to God when it comes to authority and leadership? We looked how, at how even though God has created us all um, to carry the same value and, we, and God loves us all at the same time, He's also given us different functions and different ways in which we operate. We're not all the same. Not one of us are the same. We don't even have the same fingerprints. Am I right? So we're all going to do things somewhat differently. And God has appointed himself as head over Christ. Christ is the head of the church. And we all submit to Christ. And then in the home, we have the wife submitting to the husband, the husband being the head, but the wife also being a co-leader in the home, being able to do everything that needs to be done. But that's just the structure of how God has set it up. Amen. So there's, there's, no, there's no you can't do anything. It's just a matter of God's priority, the way he wants things. Can we honor that? Okay, I can. Amen. All right. So um, the foundation upon which this goes is unity and harmony that comes from love as a foundation. You see, if we want unity and harmony, we have to actually care enough about one another that when we see somebody not doing so well, we actually extend ourselves out to them, reach out to them, and are concerned for them. We have to have genuine love for them. How many of you can pick up when someone's faking it? 
So if they can pick up, if you can pick up when someone else is faking it, then you know that they can pick up if you're faking it. Isn't that right? So we have to be genuine with who we are to people. We have to have genuine love for them, and we have to genuinely care about them. Yes? And so I, I, I'm just going to encourage you that the foundation in every family is the fact that love drives the family. When love doesn't drive the family, then you have corruption in the family unit. You end up with all kinds of calamities and problems and mistakes and things happening that just destroy the fabric of that family. And so when I'm talking about love, just to clarify, I'm talking not about what the world would call love, but I'm talking specifically about God's love, which would be called charity. In other words, a giving without any expectation, a willingness to serve without getting any reward from the person you're serving, because generally we know that our reward is already the Lord. We've already got enough. Amen? When you've got everything, you don't need to, you don't need to do things for anything because you've already got everything. Amen? All right. And so I just wanted to, us to have a look here um, in this recap of love. If you can just go with me in your Bibles. We're not going to change anything on the slides there just yet. Um, I just want you to go with me to 1 John chapter 4. If you guys got Bibles, praise the Lord, hallelujah. I don't use my manual Bible often enough to keep remembering where I put everything. Yeah, okay, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. So whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Okay, so God gives you his love when you're born again because he gives you his nature because God is love. But that love that's in you, that doesn't get perfected until you actually have to love someone you don't like. Jesus said, love your enemies and be kind to those who persecute you. You can't do that if you don't yet understand the love God had for you. God first loved you, therefore we first love those. Is this making sense? The very love that God has is who he is. The very love you have is who you are. But the only way to unpack that love so that it manifests in life is when you are in a situation, you have a choice. I'm either going to act selfishly in my own selfish, self-protective, because I'm under threat or whatever it is, or I'm going to act out of love. Am I right? You have those two choices, just like I do. We all have those choices. Isn't that right? So when we have this choice in every situation, we can choose to do things differently. I'm going to give you a very simple example of this just quickly because it's important that we understand how powerful this can be, all right? So my wife loves sushi, okay? Now my wife loves sushi, and I love that she loves sushi because I love sushi too, okay? But... It was her birthday um, a couple of years ago, and I decided to take her out to the Bamboo Sushi Lounge, which is up in Durban North. I'm sure some of you might have heard of it. At least those who like sushi would know, <laughs> I'd imagine. Okay, and I went with her, and it was, a rain it was raining in the evening, 
And we went in, we had a good time, we celebrated her birthday, and then we were coming back to the car. Now, I'd parked in a parking lot. If you're in Durban North area, you'll find there's very few places where you can park without a parking lot. There's like, everything is being built these days. So I parked in a parking lot, paid my ticket, and um, uh, we were going to the car, and we were going to reverse. Now, I want you to imagine this, okay? It is raining hard. In other words, the water is coming down fast, right? Okay, and while it's raining hard like this, obviously I'm in the car, I look in my rearview mirror, I'm checking to see if anyone's behind me. I check to the right, I check to the left, and I'm about to reverse, there's nothing, I'm about to reverse and I hear someone revving their engine, like very, very loudly. And so my first response is stop, right? Because you don't know where it's coming from, and you can always continue moving after you've assessed the situation. So I stop, and, I, and this car comes flying past me to the gate where the boom is. You know the boom gate. So it's flying past me. And my wife's like, yo, that's, that was because you got a fright, right? And I'm like, okay. She says, are you all right? I'm like, no, I'm good. So we reverse out, and... By this time now, there's another car behind that car, and I'm behind the car that's behind the car that drove past me. Right? You following so far? It's raining. The guy is putting in his ticket, you know, at the boom gate, putting in his ticket, and the ticket keeps coming out. What do you think happened? He didn't pay his ticket. Am I right? So I'm now, first of all, he's raced past me. So now I'm here, I'm behind a car that's behind him, and I can see what's happening. Now, the, the natural conclusion for most of us, and I would have been like this many years ago, I said, good for you, man. Nice to see you stuck there. Hey? There's an old Afrikaans saying, Hasta gewoon verbrand sy mond. Isn't that right? Hey? You don't want to be too, you don't want to be too quick. It's, uh, you can get, it can get dangerous if you go too quick. Isn't it right? So, so you can sit there and you can have that judgmental attitude, right? You can have that. Every, everyone, we've had that. I've had that. I'm sure you have at times. It's fine. But I was learning how to execute this thing called love. So I said to my wife, I said, watch this. She's like, what are you going to do? I'm like, watch. In the rain, I got out of the car and I walked very slowly to the guy's window. And I decided to get wet. I'm suffering for Jesus. You've got to do it properly. Can't do it halfway now. You just got a little splash on you. You're too concerned. No, come on now. Do it properly. Get wet. So I'm, I'm walking slowly to the guy's car and knock on the window. I said to him, uh, can I have your ticket? He's like, um, what are you going to do with it? I says, I'm going to pay it. He's like, what? I'm like, just give me your ticket. It'll be fine. Then I walked in the rain while everyone is waiting, slowly, very slowly, to the place where you pay the ticket. I paid his ticket. I brought it out. I walked back very slowly in the rain. I'm not joking. My wife was there. You can ask her. I walked back very slowly, and I said to him, Jesus loves you so much. Have an awesome evening. Was that difficult? Yo, we didn't even need someone to come out of a wheelchair and we got someone's attention. Love is powerful. It is so countercultural. It, it completely bamboozles everybody. It caught the devil off guard so badly that it took him about 150 years to figure out how to start slowing us down. This is what you carry. You carry this. You carry this treasure because you have the nature of God. But the more you choose and the more I would choose to satisfy my flesh instead of exercising who I am in Christ, the less of Christ will be revealed in me. Does it make sense? We don't have some secret hidden man of sin living inside of us. We have a body. This body has its own will, has its own desires, has its own things that it wants. 
It has the things it likes and the things it doesn't like. And it will let you know. And unless you tell this body, no, 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 no. You're getting this thing mixed up, bud. The Spirit's in charge, not you. Unless you get in that place where you say, no, 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 no. You might feel uncomfortable here, but this is exactly where we need to be so we can shine. Come on now. Okay. So love has to be the foundation. So I want to show you the difference between in structure when it comes to love. Now, this is a picture. Can you see the picture there? It's a military picture. Those of you who have been in the military, you know the value of military. I'm not running anything down about the military. But what I want to do is I want to just share with you what happened to Moses, because I want to show you how Moses structured things and, and then how Jesus structured things so you can see the difference between how these things are structured, okay? And how the one is driven by a sense of love and community and family, whereas the other one is driven by a sense of, you will obey my orders because I'm in charge. Am I right? So in Exodus 18, verse 17 to 23, um, this is what happened. Moses' father-in-law says to Moses, what, are you, what you're doing is not good. You and your people with you will certainly wear yourselves out, for the thing that you have is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. So in the context, what was happening is the children of Israel, the Israeli people, were coming to Moses so that he could speak to God about their problems. And he was having to speak to every single Israelite. And when you get to thousands of Israelites, do you think you're going to be able to cope with that many? No, right? And so um, Moses' father-in-law is right. He's saying, this is not going to work. Then he says, in verse 19, now obey my voice, I will give you advice, and God will be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God, and you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them known the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Moreover, look for able men from all the people, able men, yeah, from all the people who fear God, who who are trustworthy and who hate a bribe and place such men over the people, place them over the people as chiefs of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. So what is he doing there? He's breaking the group of people down into smaller groups and he's putting a chief over each one of them. He's putting a chief over them. Yes? So that means that that guy is going to be chief over them. He's going to lord it over them. Isn't that right? Okay. And let them judge the people at all times, every great matter that they shall bring to you, but any small matter they shall decide themselves, so it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. You do this, God will direct you, you will be able to endure, and all the people also will go to their place in peace. So this seems like good advice, and for many years this did work. It worked for Moses, in the camp with the children of Israel, it worked. But this advice came from his father-in-law, who is a Gentile, who was part of the armies, who understood how to put rank and file into a group of people. This is what he did. And today, even our court systems are based on the same principle, where you have local, national, and then supreme. You know, you get all the different courts. You get the national court, and then the Supreme Court, and so on. Am I right? So, so you'll see this, this kind of hierarchical structure happening within the children of Israel's legal system and how they're managing it. And this removes, this way of doing things, completely removes the need for relationship. You don't have to have relationship with the person you're judging. All you've got to know is know what they did wrong, and who's the witnesses, and then assess the situation and come up with a judgment. Am I right? How many of you have uh, been to court and made the judge your best friend? Doesn't tend to happen. Am I right? So, so the, the reality is that judges, they don't ever help you get better. They're just out there to judge what you did wrong. Yes? So a judge cannot be a mentor. So in this particular situation, you can see that 
these guys were placed there just to rule over the people according to these legal matters. Okay, so let's go to Matthew 20, verse 20. Matthew 20, verse 20 to 28. And it says there, Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him and her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. Now she's speaking to Jesus, just so you know. And he said to her, What do you want? And she said to him, Say that these two sons of mine are to sit one at your right hand and one at your left hand in your kingdom. Okay, so what happened here? The disciples went to their mommy, said, Mommy, you've got to help us. You've got to speak to Jesus. We want to be sure that we will have the left and the right hand of Jesus when he comes in his kingdom. And so Mommy decided to do her sons a favor and go talk to Jesus. Am I right? Okay? So now she's, she's talking to Jesus, and Jesus answers. He says, do you not know what, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And they said to him, we are able. And he said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. So watch, watch what's happening here. Jesus doesn't just make a decision. He doesn't just say, okay, you can be at my right hand, you can be at my left. He says, no, 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 no. I, my father makes his mind up about that stuff. What's Jesus doing? He's honoring the father, isn't he? When, when, he, when, he is saying, when he's saying, no, my father is the one who makes that decision, he's saying, no, I'm submitted. I've submitted to the father and his decisions. I'm not going to make that decision myself. My father will make that decision. Does it make sense? Okay, so, so this is important because when we look at what Jesus is saying here, he's telling the, the, the um, mother of these two disciples, no, this is not my decision to make. Then what happens is this creates a problem with the other disciples, that the other disciples start getting indignant with these disciples. This is not some abstract idea, story, right? This is something that can happen very easily. Am I right? Okay. And so what's happening here is now the other disciples are thinking, who are these two guys to go and get mommy's help, to come and help them to get a position better than all of us? Are you with me? So this is happening. This is like, this is happens whenever you talk about titles and positions, people start getting all weird and strange. It's, it, it happens. Okay. But watch this. Watch what Jesus does. He says, But Jesus called the disciples to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. What does it say there? You know that the rulers of the Gentiles, what do they do? They lorded over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. What does it say? It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. Can you see the difference between how Moses was informed to structure things and how Jesus came and made everything a family. It went, it went from a kind of a necessary military-style organization in order to help facilitate the management of people under the law to God's original plan, which was that families who are relationally connected to one another, have a care for one another, and want to see one another grow and go to greater heights than they've ever gone before, those, those people have got a better kind of connectivity and continuity. They've got a better robustness. They can go through more things together because they'll tighten the ranks rather than running off because they know their strength in their relationship with one another and with God. 
This is a very important thing to realize the difference between these two things. Jesus came to say no. The, if, if Jesus, who's God, calls us brother, then who are we to make ourselves higher than anyone? We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. We're all kings and queens in the kingdom. Amen? Some of us are still learning to be better kings. Others of us are still coming into the kingdom. But we're all in different stages, and it's beautiful, and everyone's moving in the right direction. Praise the Lord. Amen? We're frustrated when things get derailed because that then it stumps people's progress. It stumps them from getting to the next level where they're able to enjoy their identity deeper. Amen? All right. So what facilitates this is very much the next thing. If we don't actually have any training with the people that we mentor or the groups that we're mentoring, if we don't do any kind of training with them, we don't disciple them, we don't guide them, we don't give them um, biblical um, good advice, if we don't do these things, what will happen is they will rely eventually on the wisdom that they're getting, which is from the world. How many of you know that 24-7 there is some media avenue or stream or somebody who's putting something out there on YouTube or Instagram or Facebook or somewhere where you are being bombarded with information that you don't necessarily want in your life? Yeah? And so if the enemy is proactively trying to unrenew your mind, then if you are passive... The unrenewing is happening to you. Yeah? But if you are proactively renewing your mind, in other words, you are choosing on a daily basis to let go of ideas that are no longer biblical and to hold on to the biblical values and what God has taught you, if you're willing to do that, then you go from strength to strength. Because then you begin to renew your mind. And it's through the renewal of the mind that the belief systems change, that your actions change, that your life changes. Amen? And so as, as people in a family, normally what you do is you teach your children, don't you? As a family, you teach your children. You teach them norms. You teach them habits. You teach them um, you know, how to cook. I mean, my daughter has learned how to cook. She's learned how to... Um, so she's learned how to do all these wonderful things, play instruments, etc., all because there were family around her. And I include all of you as that family. Because you're family. We need to start moving away from this idea of church being anything else other than family. Because we are family. And spirit is thicker than blood. I'm trying to not be too aggressive on stage. Spirit is thicker than blood. What Jesus paid for with his blood gave us access to something way better than just a descendancy from Adam. We became plugged into the descendancy from heaven. We are now the children of God. We sang that song. How can we sing that song and then even veer slightly away from it? We know that we've got his life flowing through our veins. Isn't that right? He's with us. Yes, it's so awesome. And so when we do this, and the, this is go to the verse, I want, to see, I want you to see this. It says in Deuteronomy 6, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lay down, and when you rise. You know how much you talk about rugby? The same. Isn't that what it says? When you sit down, when you lay down, when you get up, when you, whenever you go anywhere, what will happen? You will speak to your children about God's word. Now, this is talking about the law, but let's be honest, in the new covenant, isn't it equally important to train our children to understand who God is, to understand better who they are, to understand their destiny and their purpose better so that they have direction in life? What if the number one problem with most Kids and people getting depressed today is the fact that they feel hopeless because they don't see a way forward or something worth living for. Ephesians 4, 11 to 13 says, And he gave the apostles, 
the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So you could say he gave the uncles, the aunts, the stepmoms, and the stepfathers, or the fathers-in-law and the mothers-in-law. You could say the same thing, right? Because these guys are gifted by the Holy Spirit to equip you with a facet of who Christ is. Jesus was apostolic, he was evangelical, he was a teacher, he was a prophet, he was everything, was he not? So all of it is in Jesus, and Jesus is giving peace by peace out to certain people as they are then equipping you so that you can have all of it. Because the whole point of equipping you is so that you go do something with it. That's why we all wanted to be equipped, because we wanted to be able to go and do stuff with what God has given us. Amen? All right. So you can see here, it says, until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to the mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So maturity is measured by Christ's fullness. In other words, as we are growing up into Christ, to the degree that we are grown up into Him, to that degree we are mature. And the idea is that all these gifts are meant to equip us in the body. So it's like having a father and a mother and having an aunt and an uncle. Right? They give you different things, but they're all there to give you what you need so that you can navigate life. I know it's a weak example, but hopefully you can draw the correlation. Right? So these gifts are given to equip you so that you can equip others. That's the reason why they're given. And so in families, it's very important that we learn to train and disciple not only our children, but also our spiritual children, those that God gives us. Because as you all know, unless we reach out, the world doesn't know. How will the world know what you know if you're not willing to let them know what you know? Isn't that right? A famous businessman once said, you can have the greatest idea in all the world, but if you never market it, it will still be useless. So if you don't actually share the good news, no one hears the good news. And don't underestimate what God is doing in you and how much that is speaking to people around you. Because he, people are watching. Let me tell you, people are more watching these days than ever before. You can have a thousand people see your Facebook post and only two people will like it. What does it mean? People watch more than what they respond. Isn't that right? They watch more than what they respond. People will watch and watch and watch. And when they see your life transforming and changing, they will say, what do they have? Because whatever they have, I need it. And when they say that, guess what? That's an opportunity for you to invite them to also join the kingdom of God. Amen? All right. And then next, family gives us inheritance. There's a transgenerational aspect to family. The whole idea is that as families grow, they should get stronger and stronger. And as they grow and get stronger, they should be able to go further and further and do better and better. Yes? And so there is this inheritance that comes. For example, in Proverbs 13, 22, it says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Notice, not to his children only, but to his children's children. Because what is he doing? He's helping his children so that his children's children will also be helped. Amen? Okay. Romans 8, verse 16 to 17 says, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may be glorified with Him. So what is He saying? He's saying, provided you stay in the faith. Am I right? Okay, so He's saying, provided that you continue to believe, then guess what? You are heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ. That means that Jesus has brought this whole family up into heaven, and we are all part of the heavenly family. This is good news. We have inherited heaven. We have inherited righteousness. We have inherited holiness. 
We have inherited everything we could never earn. God gave to us freely. Just think about this for a minute. Okay? Just, just for a minute. It seems that we all tend to struggle with accepting the fact that something that magnificent could be given to us free of charge. It does seem to be a thing in society where even when they advertise, you know, they advertise a free phone, you still end up paying every month. You know? It's like there's it's almost as if marketing is largely guilt geared towards getting you to come and get free stuff that you pay for. And, and, and then when the Bible says it's free, we're so indoctrinated by the world and that mechanism that we think there's still something we need to pay for. Sub subconsciously, I think there's that, that, that barrier, and I want to smash that barrier because God gave it to you free of charge. He paid it all. It's yours. You are part of this family, not because you deserve it, but because God wanted you here. Come on. That, what a privilege that God chose for you to be here because he knew that your unique gifts are what this place needs so that he can advance his kingdom. You're not here by accident. You woke up and you intended to be here this morning because the Holy Spirit has been inspiring you to be here because this is where your family is. Amen? And this is what inheritance means. It means that we don't have a two-year plan, a five-year plan, a ten-year plan. No, no, no. We have a four, five-hundred-year plan. Why? Because each generation should be taking more ground than the generation before. And just maybe we'll get the father to decide to send the son back sooner so that we don't end up just taking over the whole planet. Because it does say in Matthew 24 that until this gospel of the kingdom of God is preached throughout the whole world, the end will not come. So everyone wants the end to be tomorrow because they think the world has gone to hell in a handbasket, right? But we know that God came to die for those people, to set them free so that they can come into the kingdom. How can we? How can we not care about what's happening to their eternal souls? Surely we must. And we want to bring them into our family and the family of God so they too may experience the inheritance that comes from the king. Amen. So last week, I closed with this. I'm going to close with it again. The whole mission and mandate of the church is to be a family on the earth that represents the family of God. It's a place where people can come in and they can get healed and they can be restored and they can be um, re-established in God. It's also a place where people, after they've gone through that, what we would call a hospital phase, they're then equipped and trained and able to go out and equip and train others. Every single one of us have within us this treasure that we are able to bring forth in every discussion to people because we have the love of God in us. Let me ask you, and I'd, l I'd really like you to respond to this. How many of you think that you can find one person to speak to this week and share the love of God with them? How many of you think you can find one person this week? Okay. Can I challenge you to go and find that person and speak to them this week? Intentionally speak to them about the love of God, about how much God loves them, about how much God wants them to be part of his family and what he was willing to do in order for them to be part of it? Do you think you can do that? Don't worry, I'm not going to police you on it. <laughs> I want to encourage you because I notice that many people don't hear the goodness of God because the people who experience the goodness of God are not necessarily sharing about the goodness of God. They just 
so caught up in daily life, they're not necessarily making that intention to intentionally engage with somebody. Just one person in a whole week. I'm sure you see more people in a week than one person. Amen? So God's mission has always been manipul- um, sorry, has always been multiplication and growth. Okay? And multipl- multiplication and growth is what families do. Right? Go and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. That is what families do. But they do it in a way that brings life. Am I right? How many of you enjoy your grandchildren? More so, like someone once said, having grandchildren is like God's reward for not killing your own children when you had the chance. You know, I've never said that, but they say that. Do you understand what I'm saying? When you have grandchildren, you see the potential in them and what they're going to become one day, and you've already now seen your children move into that phase of where they've got their own family and they're starting. Am I right? And so you see the beauty of the whole thing unpacking itself, but it's actually part of God's DNA for heaven to invade the earth. Family, discipleship is family. Because we are disciplining our children, don't we, in the ways of the Lord, which means we are discipling them. So this is what I believe the Lord is saying. That you have more in you than you think you have. That you carry more with you than you think you carry. And that you have more to share than you think you have to share. Let me, God, work through you. Stop trying to be good enough when I've already made you good enough. Amen? So next week, we'll be finishing up with this. Go to the next one. We'll be talking about covenant provision, and reflecting God's character. Look exciting? Have you learned something this morning? Can I pray for you? Please stand up for me. Do you want to share something first? All right. Now let's just reach our hands to Jesus. Holy Spirit, I know that you are always with us, that you are in this place, and that you are the one that gives us boldness. You are the one that gives us the ability to stand up and be counted for the kingdom. So Holy Spirit, I ask right now that a very sweet presence will be with every single one of your sons and daughters in this house. They'll be constantly reminded of the treasure that they are, the treasure that they carry, and the treasure that they have to give. Father, that your love for them will consume them and that their, that love will motivate them and drive them to do what you have called them to, to be all that you have called them to. I bless them. I thank you that they are whole and healed and free and provided for in every area.